All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Justin Cunningham, who is in Auckland in New Zealand, all the other side of the world and in the future too. How are you doing, Justin? <laughs> Uh, I'm doing really well, John. Thanks so much for the intro. Yeah, the, the future looks bright, people. The future looks bright. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And Justin is on a mission to create positive change. Uh, he, your work and life is to empower people, revealing what stops us, what, uh, what, what unlocks us, what we can do about it, unleash our gifts to the world. And what we're going to talk about today is how deep connection delivers maximized sales so um, maybe you just start us off, uh, Justin, just bottom line, what, when, when you mean deep connection, you, maybe you define that for us. Well, from being a, a sales trainer and working with small businesses all mm -hmm. the way through to billion dollar companies like Coke and Mercedes Benz and various other people, one of the things that I've kind of found is depending on whether what type of sales role you're in, uh, so, for example, if you're in a, a small business or even a micro business and it's basically you selling, uh, it's much easier to get into relationship selling and you kind of rely on that. Um, whereas there are a lot of other roles where it's like you have this amount to, to hit with your sales. This is what you're looking to do. This is what you're looking to achieve. And so what can happen is, is it can be a little bit of a disconnect between what's most important. Forming a deep relationship or uh, maximizing the value from that customer. So we would all like to maximize our customer lifetime value clearly. And what I've discovered is, is that we've all heard the saying, people buy emotionally and defend it logically. The sure. only way to truly connect with someone on an emotional level is to ask them a lot of deep questions and to establish, you know, more than your basic rapport. I remember when people used to train, you know, for the first two minutes with the customer, you just talk about anything social and then get into your sales questions. And I thought, oh, that's such a formulaic thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then when I was working with, again, these very large companies, and I was also, I work with uh, New Zealand's leading sales process company. One of the things that was really coming about was the idea that you ask, you know, six or seven questions uh, was becoming passe. And that right. in reality, you know, to make a premium sale, for example, you really need to be asking probably somewhere between 10 and 20 plus questions to get anywhere near understanding what's going on for that person. So I started taking that methodology into every level that I was servicing with people. And I discovered that that was yeah, quite common, that people didn't spend the time forming a deep connection. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really understand their client's past. Uh, for example, they were like, well, why are you here? Well, I'm here for this. Okay, let me help you. But if you don't understand their past, then you don't understand what they're walking into the room or the conversation with, both mm -hmm. negative and positive. They're going to have a negative right. idea about certain things and a positive idea about certain things. And when you understand their past, it's much easier for you to value match and for them to feel like, wow, this guy is just... He just understands me on a level that I just did not expect. I thought I was just going yeah. to buy this thing, but this person is about enabling my future, not just even giving me a solution. And of course, what does that lead to? A really optimal opportunity to maximize your, your sales size, but it doesn't come from that I'm going to win the sale mindset. Yeah. It comes from I'm going to form a deep connection that matters. Yeah, and um, and what's what's interesting? Let me just pick a, a, up on something. A couple of things you said. The first one was, yeah, there used to be that whole formulaic thing. I mean, you've probably experienced yourself. Uh, salesperson calls on you, maybe comes into your office, and you see them already looking over your shoulder at the photos of your family. So they'll go, and then start into the oh, what a lovely family. Tell us about that, and you're like, okay, I'm I'm not really ready for this. I've just met you, and where you want to talk about my family? Like I prefer to do something else. But I think we have it backwards because, as you said, if you start in on those deep questioning and really trying to understand the situation the person is, the other stuff will come with it. You don't. So for me, it's it's always been backwards. Well, and the other thing is, is that we all know the old adage: "There's only three ways to grow your sales: 
increase your customers, increase your average sale and increase the frequency of sale. Mm -hmm. And increasing customers is the most expensive, most difficult, most challenging thing to do. Yeah. And, and so even with existing clients that you've already got, if you form a deeper relationship, you will increase the value both personally of the relationship, but also from a monetary value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, another friend of mine has got an agency that's focused on doing it. And I just think that's brilliant. He's got a team that goes to people's existing client base right. and essentially establishes a deeper understanding of what's going on for them to uncover more opportunities to support them rather mm -hmm. than going to an agency that's designed around prospecting or cold calling or whatever it is. I mean, I just think that's ingenious. Yeah. Um, so what, again, what, just, 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 it, yeah, no, it's just to say, just, just on, on that, uh, on that whole idea is it's, we, we live in the strange world today, right? I call it the shortcut culture, right? Everything is quick and easy and um, there's a shortcut for everything. And what you're describing here, number one, that, that requires you to have a level of curiosity, like real curiosity and a, a desire to really understand. So really kind of an insatiable curiosity so you can go deep with those questions because most people are still keeping it at a, at a very high level because that's the way everything is in the world. Everything is superficial. So they're kind of playing, you know, kind of fall into that trap. Yeah, well, I'm trained a number of behavioral modalities as well as sales stuff and copy and creative mm -hmm. stuff. And my work is based around the premise that beliefs form behaviors and behaviors form outcomes. And there's a reason why you might know how to succeed and yet you're not. And that's because 90% of what you're doing is unconscious and only five or 10% of it is conscious. And so once we work on that unconscious stuff with both ourselves and with the people that we're, we're, we're relating to, then all of a sudden all these things open up. And, and again, you know, sales has been one of the most interesting industries for understanding how psychology works with mm -hmm. you know hypnotic language and things like that you know say their name over and over and over who why do you do that because who knows my name the people that i love and care about so if you keep saying my name then on an unconscious level i'm cluing into the fact oh you're somebody special right now that does sound kind of relatively manipulative but the bottom line is everyone's favorite subject is themselves and if you can understand where I've come from and you take enough time to, to find out where I'm going, you can maximize all sorts of things. I mean, to give you an example, a specific example you could apply. Yeah. Uh, say in terms of a sales question, you know, one sales question I know that just reveals money all over the place is what have you done previously to try and resolve this problem? What did you like about that solution and what would you change about it if you could? Now, that question literally tells you, don't do this and give me all of this and resolve those problems yeah. in this with whatever you say next. And that's what I want. Now, it's so mm -hmm. easy, um, but it's a question that reveals where I've come from. What are my beliefs? What are, what's my scar tissue kind of coming into this conversation? Am I cynical? You know, I come across... A lot of people that are quite cynical, as you say, about shortcuts and I've got the million dollar solution for yeah. you in just 30 minutes and, and all this sort of stuff. And so therefore, you, you've got to address that cynicism. Like, where did it come from? Mm -hmm. And for me, for example, I really stand against the idea that you learn more and you earn more. I think that's complete rubbish. And statistically, there's no proof. In fact, Tony Robbins and Marissa Murgatroyd and a lot of these people that do these kind of business online development to help people get launch their own businesses, they've admitted that they only have a five to six percent success rate. Right. You know, Sanford University says goal setting only has an eight percent success rate because the reality is you've got to learn, you've got to implement, you've got to apply, you've got to manage. And so there's a lot of success mythology out there, Don, you know, and that is one of the things that I have noticed about about how people learn things. They learn things kind of right oh, well, that's what I've heard. Therefore, that's what I'll do. And it's like, well, why don't you, why don't you feel the truth right now mm. and see what happens? 
Yeah. Do you know, I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a lot of what you just said there um, that's that's very interesting um, that I want to hone in on. And one of the first ones there is is the idea is that if you do, even the questions that you said, those three questions, not only ask them, but you have to really listen to the answers and understand them. Because that's the other thing is like people will ask questions all day long, but they don't actually listen to the answers because they're too busy or they listen to the first few words and then they're busy formulating a response instead of really trying to understand and validate. I mean, that's the other thing is how often how often do people validate with you when they're setting to and say, you know, I just want to be clear about what you're saying or understand here. This is what you said. I want to be clear about it because that's another great respect element. If you say to me, I just want to make sure I understood everything you said to me, that's a sign of respect. Oh, I couldn't agree more. That is a really beautiful technique. Um, mirroring is very, very important. Uh, it's not important what you say. It's important what they understand about what you said. And for people that don't check that, they'll leave, they're making a massive mistake. What you just said there is if, if the people that are listening to this, do this, do exactly what John just said. Ask, what do you understand about what I just said? Because that could be completely different to what you just said. <laughs> and yeah. it, it'll, it'll blow your mind, actually, what people hear versus what you say. But it will yeah. also uncover how they process what you're saying. And so you can modify what you're doing. But again, you know, I really, uh, I couldn't agree more in terms of being present and reflecting. Yeah, and there's the other one there, being present, uh, Justin. So let's talk a, a little bit about that because I, again, going back to the world we live in today, is like being present is at a premium. To be honest, I mean, how often have you used to even even with people you know really well, your closest friends or whatever? How often have you been having a conversation and their phone buzzes and they immediately glance down and look at it and then come back to the conversation and you already know you're not present at all. But it's become it's it's become this habit. We, we don't even call it out. We don't even go, hey, John, that was a little rude. I mean, we're in the middle of a conversation here. We allow it go. And I and I feel that that's creeping into everything. So if you are really present and you really focus on what people are saying, you're going to stand out. Um, most definitely. But I, I think that, again, listening is the greatest skill. Listening like, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's. The sales stuff, there's nothing new about it. It's the nuance. And again, as you say, everyone's got the attention span of a goldfish these days. So, so you know, you, you when you give somebody and you really listen and you reflect back, and this is one of the things that I do a lot. My, my wife is a trained intuitive and, and she was done this sort of work since she was six years old, worked in institutes right. and academies and all sorts of stuff. And she kind of showed me the power of that stuff. And I find that when I'm talking to somebody in a sales conversation, they're talking about what's going on. I'm reading into what they're feeling as they say and as they share mm -hmm. and noticing what's happening there because what it does is it sort of reveals to me about what it means to them. Because if you can get to the meaning of the outcome, not just supply an outcome, again, you're going you're gonna to come across as extraordinary. And I know for myself mm -hmm. that when I've reflected back uh, my insights into what's going on for them as well as what they said, <clears throat> their minds just get blown. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you know that? Like, how are you? But as uh, a coach or a trainer or a salesperson, you know, often you come across the same sort of feedback a lot from people about how what's going on mm -hmm. for them in their business. But what they're really looking for is someone that understands me. Do you understand yes. me? Not just what I want, but do you understand me? Because if you can speak my language and understand my journey, I'm going to choose you over everybody else every day of the week. Yeah, and and I think I think Justin, a lot a lot of times people underestimate that or forget that piece about the fact that when you're in a when you I always use this um, example. I say in B two C sales, right? If I go off and buy a huge brand new huge screen tv uh, today the, probably the worst thing that's going to happen to me is my wife's going to go mental that we didn't spend the money on something better uh, or different 
But in a B2B sale, completely different, right? Not only, I'm not just buying them part of the company, I'm actually attaching myself to this project or whatever it is. And so it can be career enhancing, it could be career limiting, depending on how it works out. So there's a lot of emotion and personal, yeah. uh, you know, and personal uh, stuff wrapped up in it. And I think sometimes, you know, uh, salespeople forget to uncover or recognize that piece. Oh, I couldn't agree more, John. Like exactly what you're saying is a big part of the stuff that I un unveil and the belief stuff, and it's fear. You know, especially mm -hmm. like as you say, there's a big difference between B2B and B2C, and like yourself, I've worked in both. And with with B2B, for example, with hierarchies, you know, everyone's got to account yeah. to somebody else. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also if I've got a great job with a good income and someone comes along with a solution that could both help me but could also put me in the firing line, I'm yeah. going to be very hesitant to pull the trigger on that. And, you know, there's only four things that decision makers, true decision makers and businesses are, are measured on, and that's increasing sales, decreasing costs, improving efficiency and ensuring compliance. Mm -hmm. And if you can frame your your conversation to show them how they're safe, they're going to grow, they're going to be more efficient and get given back time, and there's not going to be any implications in terms of compliance. That's a very, very sexy way of framing things. And I remember when I first learned that and I started applying it, it just blew my mind because immediately clients were just going, that's what I want. That's what I want. Because I was not only addressing their solution, I was addressing their internal fears of judgment mm -hmm. and that their security might be threatened by taking action. And that's a big thing yeah. that I very rarely hear salespeople talking about is the fear of taking action in terms of my security. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's critical for everybody. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And that's why I always think that when you'll find a lot of a lot of people uh, don't lose deals to competitors, they lose them to no decision. Right. And and they don't go back and actually ask themselves, why am I getting why am I, why am I getting so many no decisions? But it's exactly what you're talking about there. If you haven't addressed those those issues, uh, then you're giving you're giving your prospect the opportunity to say, you know, it might work for me. This might be good, but mm, on the downside, it mightn't be that good. So maybe I'm just better off staying as is for now. You know, I mean, let's face it, we run for safety and the status quo always feels good to us. So you have to address those issues. Otherwise, no decisions are going to haunt you. Yeah. And one of the best ways to do that is to address the fear or and, you know, even ask the question like, mm -hmm. so if you were to do this, like how could how could we completely stuff this up for you? <laughs> like how could That's we completely question. put you in the poo? You know, like this is yeah. going to be a nightmare. You know, you're going to be in trouble. How, do, how would we do that if we were going to do that? Now, you see, that's so counterintuitive. But as you can see, most people's fears aren't real, right? They, they're thinking yeah. about the possible implications. They're not real. It's possible. Possibly this could happen. Possibly that I could have this opinion or possibly my boss could do this or whatever it might be. But if you actually get them to address that, you can then get them to kind of let go of the the what they think is real. Like when someone has a fear, it seems like it's 10 out of 10. But when you address mm -hmm. the likelihood of it and the implications of it and the, the true nature of it, you realize, oh, it's not really 10 out of 10. It's maybe three, three or four out of 10. And you go, okay, so how would we manage that if that was the case? So you see, that's future pacing. And remember at the start of the interview, I said about the past. Yeah. Well, now we're talking yep. about the future. So I've addressed what their pressing need is, how the future looks in terms of making a decision and where they've come from. Now, as you can hear, that will really help you stand out from anybody because people will understand, wow, you really care about making sure that I do the right thing for me uh, and for the business and you're interested in making sure that I don't make the mistakes I've made in the past and you've got a product that's superior to what I've been exposed to previously. How do you say no to that? Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. I, I, I totally, I totally agree. And and it's really, it's really interesting um, because if you 
as you probably uh, have experienced too when working with people, you know, when a lot of salespeople, when deals fall out at a late stage and they're shocked, right? It's a shock. But it was, it was, this was a certainty and now it's a shock, you know, and sometimes things happen. But oftentimes you can trace it back to early in the sales process. And what we were just talking about there, if you don't address the fear issues and all of those up front, they're just going to get pushed to the end of the cycle and the, the, the group or the person who's buying might be really excited all the way through. But at the end, when it comes to pulling the trigger, then all the fears come rushing back and you haven't addressed them. And that's when that's when I think a lot of times uh, deals fall out at a late stage. It's just because you haven't addressed those Pretty fundamental so. fears. Totally agree. I, 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 I help clients also with presentation design, John. So mm. Because a, a lot of people these days are doing webinars and presentations and then they go into a sale. And especially if they say a thought leader and they want to have some sort of a digital asset to sell. Yeah. And and so but what tends to happen is, is that if things don't go in a certain sequence, then the outcome doesn't go well. And we've all been in presentations. We were watching something and then all of a sudden the, pres the presenter goes, OK, right. And that's why I've got this thing to sell to you. And you're like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know and you all you want to do is leave the webinar at that stage right and but if you are clear and transparent again forming an honest communication you say hey at the end of this presentation i'm going to tell you about a product that i've got that's going to accelerate everything that you're really looking to achieve but in the meantime let me address why you should listen what's going on for you and and how that can be fixed so if you're here for this reason, this reason, and this reason, you're in the right room. And if that's okay, I'll carry on. Yeah. Now you see, I've already got their rebuttal about if you pitch to me, I'm out. You see, and that's the sort of thing that you can really apply to any relationship, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's B2B, B2C, is just be clear. I'm here to serve, but I'm going to ask your permission whether I can do it this way. Is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. again, even with rebuttals, you see them and you go, well, you know, I've had many people that will say that's expensive. So, but what I've discovered is that people have amnesia about how much they've spent on trying to resolve the problem with no outcomes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You exactly. Know, little things like that. And you just, just be honest. I mean, I've lived in California yeah. You know, my wife's American, so I'm very well aware of the American market. And what's interesting to me is, is that uh, in this part of the world, we we're, we're pretty straight shooters. You know, we'll we'll tell you the truth, mm -hmm. and and you know, we're all about sort of integrity and honesty and all that good stuff. And I mean, don't get me wrong; everybody says they are right, doesn't matter where you're from. <laughs> um, but I find that that kind of emotional, it's a win-win thing. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to ask your permission and I'm going to set boundaries. And will, are you prepared to play the game with me? I find that that sort of stuff is both very respectful and it creates a really balanced um, respect. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and also that make sure that there's not this feeling of, well, I'm waiting for the wizard over here to tell me about how to save the day. It's like, no, yeah, I'm yeah, working yeah. with you. Uh, I think the idea that, for example, in sales, that I'm I'm the answer that's going to save your life is just long gone. You know, salespeople should be guides towards optimized yeah. solutions, and, yeah. no, and that I'm working 100%. with you, not you know, not at you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, Justin, and uh, and the other the the other part just before we we wrap up is I just wanted to follow on on what you just said there. It's like sometimes when I run a, a sales consulting organization a number of years back, it always amazed me how companies and big some of these were big global companies. They'd say, "Oh, we need to customize all of this training because we don't call our salespeople salespeople." I'm going, "Oh, fine. Okay, what do you call them?" And they'd say, "What, well, whatever, some convoluted, some made-up title." And I always used to think to myself, and I'd say, and I would say it to them, I'd say, "That's fine, but you do know the other person knows you're a salesperson, right?" <laughs> I mean, you can call yourself whatever you want, but they know you're a salesperson. So, like, either embrace it, and if you're not embracing it, if you're trying to hide it, there's a problem. Yeah, I, I found that seat through businesses because they call that culture, you know, like, oh, we've got our own terms and we're establishing culture. I'm like, Matt, you wouldn't mm -hmm. know culture if it slapped you in the face. Um, <laughs> you know, so 
that stuff cracks me up because again it's very trying to be somehow politically correct when mm. buy into that stuff comes from heart not from planets yes. like you've got to show heart you, and you've got to understand my heart and then i'll join your revolution but don't go calling me a revolutionary just because you think you're one like that doesn't <laughs> that, that doesn't work <laughs> And I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I come from a music background, you know, like all sorts of X Factor stuff, Generation X poster kid, mm. you know, skateboarding, hip hop, all sorts of stuff. And nice. So I've lived many lives. And, and I can tell you from those sort of cult like things that it's all because it's, it's all about show and prove. Don't talk about it, be about it. You know, don't tell me yeah. about culture, yeah, yeah, be yeah. culture, you know, and. Yeah and be the example and and again hopefully everyone that's listening today has really heard that because i think this conversation's uh, followed a great thread of how you how you can connect and how you can use that and feel better about it like i'm not trying to control you manipulate you you know like dominate you i'm trying yeah, to yeah. connect on a way that of course will open up massive opportunities for everybody involved yeah, ab absolutely. That's fantastic. Just that was a great, great summary. Um, and by the way, as a as an old punk from the eighties, I uh, I uh, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's great. Um, we get to this stage of our life. It's great. We can look back on all the many different lives we've had, and sometimes totally like when people meet you today, and then you eventually when you get around to revealing parts of your past, it's great. The it's great the surprise that people have on the journeys you take. Uh, Anyway, all of Justin's yeah, information is going below this video. But before we go, Justin, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Well, long story short, people, I like to help business owners stand out. Now, in this day and age, there are so many people with the same sort of names and, and the same sort of messaging and look and all that sort of stuff. I love to help people stand out. Um, and also, I'm really into transformational business, not transactional business. I've I come across so many business owners that are overwhelmed, exhausted. And so I've studied under a lot of people that do transformational business from Jay Abraham to, uh, you know, 80, 20 principles and more sorts of things in terms of performance, because if we can address the five to 20 percent of what's working for us and double it, we can have a lot more spare time people and a lot more money in our pockets. And so that's what I like to do is to step in and look at how people can do more transformative business. And the last thing is optimization, which is just looking mm -hmm. at what are the gaps here? How do we, again, help you be more effective? There are so many people trying to do business, but they're not effective. They're trying to create outcomes. I'm like, but is it effective for you? And what do you want out of it? And we're kind of following methodologies and I'm writing a book right now on success mythology because so many of us are following stories that aren't ours. You know, we've got some discomfort with it and, yeah. and we're wondering when is this ever going to end? And uh, is there truly a better way or, uh, or are they all just snake oil salesmen just selling some elixir? And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm kind of, poking the bear with that but also sort of showing them what the alternatives are um and so yeah that's essentially what i stand for is the stand stand out transformation optimization i don't believe in the learn more earn more so i like to come into businesses make small changes that create massive impacts um and uh, yeah that's kind of my thing i suppose if i was to ask a client what what justin what's mm -hmm. the thing that you're most good at i suppose it's simplification of the complex if you're confused about decisions, you've got a confusing understanding of how to connect everything together and make it work for you. Um, I'm your guy. Uh, that's that's what I love to do. And again, I come from a creative background, so I just love working with people and helping frustrated rock stars go big. That's my thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a frustrated rock star inside all of us, I think. Um, well, listen, thanks again, Justin. Thank you all for watching and listening. And as I said, all of Justin's information will be below this video. So please go check it out. Because I'm a huge believer. Go get help. Uh, you, know, you don't have to do everything on your own. And, and it's fantastic if you go find somebody who is totally invested in your success. No agendas other than your success. So I highly encourage people, go check it out and uh, get some help. All right. Well, listen, thank you again. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thanks, team. Thanks, John.